Good morning and welcome to uh, our lesson today. Uh, this is our first lesson in December. Today is December the 4th and we'll be teaching the lesson from December the 4th. The uh, title of the new series is Putting Fear in Its Place. And the title of our lesson today is studying about having the fear of God, the fear of God. It'll be taken from Psalms chapter 33. Uh, we'll start in verse 6 and we'll go to various verses in that chapter. Uh, all the way through to verse 22. So glad you joined us today. Uh, Thanksgiving, I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. That season's come and gone. Uh, of course, we always have a reason to be thankful as we talked about last week. But today, as we concentrate on a, a new series, uh, we, want to, we want to concentrate on what, what uh, God tells us in his word about fear and how we are to handle fear. Um, so there's many different aspects of fear. Um, so we're going to cover that today. I agree. I, I just am grateful that you joined us, and uh, I'm grateful that you listened. And uh, I'd like to pray for you this morning. Uh, if you're at home sick, uh, we'll be praying for you. And if you're just uh, just uh, maybe homebound, uh, don't have a way out, or you're not able to travel, we'll certainly be praying for you. And uh, also, we'll be praying for those of you who don't have a church home and or just listening and, and trying to learn more about God, we pray that you would uh, find a church home and uh, one that teaches the Word. So we're grateful for all of you that are joining us, and uh, we want to uh, just go to the Lord in prayer at this time and lift up His name. Lord, we do come, Father, just honoring you this morning, Father, praising you, Lord, for not, not just what you do, Lord. We get tied up a lot of times on what you do for us, and a lot of our prayers are requests for things that for you to do. It's a to-do list a lot of times, Lord. Uh, and uh, we don't want to come to you with a to-do list. This morning, Father, we want to come to you not for what you do, but for who you are. And uh, who you are uh, determines a lot about what you do. Uh, Lord, I thank you that you are the creator of the universe, Father. You're all powerful. You're all knowing. Father, you, you're everywhere we are uh father you're just uh it's just a blessing father to be able to call on your name and father we're honored that we can pray to you father you've given us that right uh, through your son jesus christ who came father and uh, walked on this earth and died and was rose again that that we could have a eternal life father he went back and he paid the penalty for our sin and he's prepared a place for us in heaven and we rejoice in that today, Lord, and we thank you for that. So, Lord, as we come to you, uh, we ask you to be with us during this time that we study. I ask you to be with each one that's home listening, Father. Whatever their needs are, I pray that you, Father, you know their needs already before I even ask or before they ask. But, Father, I pray that you would, uh, that you would have your way in their life. Lord, we know uh, that our wants are not always your wants and our will is not always your will. So, Lord, what we seek is your will uh, for the best of the person that is serving you and, and uh, one that calls you their, their, their father. We just pray that you would have your will in their life and that you would, uh, Lord, uh, make their way uh, uh, one of comfort. Uh, father, one that where you comfort us in pain, you comfort us in sorrow, and even through sickness, Father, you, 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 you are with us and you... Uh, give us the things we need to be healed. So, Lord, we praise you, we honor you, and we want to glorify your name with this today. And I pray that you would uh, uh, let your word be prevalent in this message and that uh, you would be glorified in all is said and done. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. So, it's a time that we're going to be studying, as I said earlier, about fear, fear of God. Uh, you know, the fear of God, if we have the uh, right view of God and the right understanding of God, then it, it gives us a basis for all other uh, relationships and all other fears that we may have in our life. Um, I didn't know, to, I, I guess I should have known, but I didn't know that Franklin Roosevelt was famous for this, this statement. It says, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. I've heard that statement. I've quoted it myself before, but for some reason I didn't. I guess I didn't pay attention when I was in school, but uh, Franklin Roosevelt made that statement, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Well, I don't know about you, but uh, 
maybe President uh, Roosevelt had never uh, stepped on a snake or <laughs> maybe he had never uh, been out in the dark when uh, something was very spooky going on. You know, you, you have this fearful uh, anxiety that comes over you, but but uh, we, we, we don't have to fear because the Lord tells us that, that we don't have to fear. Uh, we have to fear him, but it's a reverent fear. A lot of times we don't like to admit that we're afraid, especially us men. We don't like to admit that we're afraid. Uh, we don't like to admit that something bothers us. Uh, but fear is, is necessary and it's beneficial, especially the fear of God. That is a necessary fear that we all should have. And it's, a, it's not a fear that he's going to strike us down, although he could, and although sometimes he should. But it's a fear uh, that uh, sees his greatness, it sees his uh, glory, his power. Um, we recognize his authority and his power over us. It's, it's, a, it's a fear of awe or reverence, and we trust him to take care of us. So the writings today is from a psalmist, and uh, we're going to look at what the psalmist tells us about fear. Uh, with verse 6, the psalmist begin to list some of the reasons uh, why the Lord is worthy of praise, and he's worthy to be feared, and he's worthy to be held in awe or, or reverence, reverend. Uh, first of all, he is creator. You know, he made all things. Everything that we have, everything that we see, uh, the, uh, every piece of grain of sand, every piece of dust, everything uh, was made by him. Every little ant, every little uh, insect, every giant animal, everything was made by him. So we, we, because he is creator of everything, then he is worthy of praise. He's, uh, he, he made all things and he also sustains all things. He's not only the giver of life, he's the sustainer of life. He gives us every breath we take. Um, and he continues and he wants to interact with us as his children uh, if we've accepted Christ our Savior. You know, that's why uh, Christ created us is for fellowship. And uh, we can't fellowship with him if we don't respect him and we don't have uh, that relationship with him that he is our father. Um, he's our protector and he's our provider. Um, he he's, um, makes makes a way for us to, to get through difficult circumstances. Uh, that may be sickness, that may be a, a loss of a job, that may be um, a death of a loved one, but he, he is the one who sustains us and gives us the, uh, the, the things that we need to get through, the, through those difficult, difficult situations. When we worship God, it, it glorifies him and it enriches our lives of, of the ones who, who actually worship him and the ones who love him. It makes us better. It enriches us. And when we fear him, um, we, we will be made better. When we have the right view of God, we will be better. Psalms 33, 6 through 9 says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. All the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathered the waters of the sea together as a heap, and he layeth upon the deep in the storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. The Old Testament uh, speaks of God's greatness and omnipotence. Um, we see the... Uh, the Lord is, is seen in many, many different ways, but especially as creator of the universe. Uh, since he created everything, since he made everything, then it's only natural that he would have dominion over everything. Uh, nothing uh, that he created is superior to him. Uh, everything is believed, uh, beneath uh, him. Uh, we are not smarter than him. We are not wiser than him. Uh, everything that he created he put his breath into, and he also maintains uh, a, a presence over us where he is our ruler and he is, is our God. Uh, the psalmist urged the kin, kin, congregation here to sing a new song, to sing a new song, um, meaning that 
that what the Lord, that, that which the Lord has created continues to spring up. And so it's a fresh and it's a renewed spirit. By the Lord, word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. Um, we should be praising the Lord for, for his creation. Just by speaking it, he's made these things. In verse 1 through 5, um, we see these things where, where the psalmist is telling us to sing and rejoice. He says, Rejoice in the Lord. And he says, Praise the Lord with harp. Sing unto him with instruments. Sing unto him a new song. Why? Because the Lord, he is righteous and he is truth. The Lord is righteous and he is truth. He, he loves righteousness. He loves justice. He loves judgment. He wants us to live righteously and to be just in our service to him. In verses 1 through 5, the, the psalmist directed his readers to sing praises. And then he detailed the, the greatness of God. He detailed the greatness of God. And he gave us the reasons that we should worship him. He said, first of all, in verse 6, by, the, by his word were the heavens made. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. You know, the ability to make something with our hands is, is quite an accomplishment. Uh, I used to try my hand at welding or doing other projects, even laying rock and different things. And to, to, to finish something and stand back and see it, it it's, to see something that I've made with my hands is a great accomplishment. And um, you take pride in that. But can you imagine the power of the Lord? that he could speak things into existence. The Lord just spoke and the heavens were made. The, the lofty habitat of the stars and, and all the celestial bodies, the planets, all that was made by him just speaking. The Lord here is written in capital letters. Um, and that, as we studied last week, that means that Yahweh, that is the name of the covenant God that, that he, he first revealed to Moses at Mount Sinai. So here we're talking about the covenant God, Yahweh, the Lord. This is the Lord, the great I am, the one who is and who will be forever. He is worthy of praise, for he is one great God. He is, he is a wonderful, wonderful God creator and look at what all he's created you ever think about this god could have created everything in black and white we could not have we could have had just black and white world no colorful leaves no beautiful white snow no uh none of the colors that we see in the blue sky uh none of the beautiful sunsets that we see it could all just been black and white why did God put color to everything? Why did he make it so attractive and so beautiful? It's because he wanted us to enjoy his creation. And he spoke that in. It says, all of the host of them, the heavens and the earth, everything was made by the breath of his mouth. The planets, the stars, the moon, everything was assigned their place and put in place just by the, the breath of, from his mouth. He breathed the word and all the stars was born, according to the New Living Testament. God, in verse 7, we see that God not only made the, the heavens, the Creator Lord also has control over the waters and raging rivers and waterfalls. It says he gathered up the waters of the sea together as a heap and he layeth up the deep depth in the storehouse. Uh, nobody can hold back the mighty waters. Uh, we can build a dam to back some water up, but it's the water's still going to flow, and it's going to flow through an orifice in the dam or some way to get around the dam. Or if it can't flow, it will bust the dam to dam. The water pressure is so great. But the waters will continue flowing. Uh, the, the oceans will continue to raise. We'll have waves, and we can't stop the waves. There's nothing we can do to stop it. God created those. God is the only one who can stop them. And we see that he did stop the, the, the waters. He, he dried up the Jordan River where people could cross. He dried up the Red Sea. Um, he, he spoke and those things happened. 
He's separating the waters from the firmament and the masses. He did that. He gathered the seas together as a heap. He 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 put the he, he gathered all the water because in the beginning the water water was over the face of the earth and darkness was over the face of the deep and he brought light and he brought land and he 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 made the seas and he made the rivers and he made the lakes. You see, he he did all that with just with his breath. Uh, heaps uh, sometimes is means to put the water in water skins, uh, a container for holding water. You see, God is capable of gathering the water up and holding it back. We've seen that example in the in the Bible. And he puts depths into the storehouse. He it, it brings here to mind the farmer who collects uh, who collects water in his reservoir and he collects water in buckets or cisterns for use later. Uh, we, we never see the ocean running dry. Uh, sometimes our ponds may dry up, but our streams, they continue to run. The ocean continues to, to, to run. So the waters are there for us and the Lord provides that. He said, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Let all the earth fear the Lord and all the inhabitants of the earth fear him. He's talking here about um, the the whole earth, everybody on the earth, all the inherit, all the inhabitants of the earth. Um, he's not talking about terror, uh, fright when he says that we fear him, but he's talking about respect and awe. How do we respond to our Creator? How do we respond to Him? Do do we see Him as one who has all power? Do we see him as one who gives lives and can take away, take away life? How do we respond to him? The fear of the Lord was prominent in the Old Testament. Um, it, it can refer to intense terror. Um, some evildoers experienced intense terror when, when they were confronted by a powerful, righteous God. Um, in most instances, however, the fear of the Lord is spoken of here as a as a deep wonderment or awe and our esteem for God and the, and the one who is the supreme ruler over all nations. This kind of fear is called the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. Uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Uh, in numerous places in the scripture, we read this. As, as Paul told the believers in Philippi in, uh, uh, in, he, in Philippians 2.12, he said, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You see, it's not, it's not bad to be fearful. Uh, sometimes we don't want to be fearful. But also the Lord told his people and prophets not to be afraid because he would take care of them in bad times. Fear was a, an unusual response. It was a usual response when, uh, when, when someone came into God's presence. God was, is so awesome. And, you know, we should have that reverence in all when we bow our heads to pray to God. Uh, we need to avoid using our, the term man upstairs and things like that. God is holy and he's, he's worthy to be worshipped and he's worthy to be praised. He is the uh, Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up. Um, there, there is a, a measurable gulf between, uh, between humans who are sinful and, and God who is holy is that that when we grasp that by, by when, we, when we see that as a sinner, when we see that how great God is and how bad we are, uh, it, it leads us to uh, uh, humble uh, contrition. It, it leads us to bow before him and to seek forgiveness. It, it, it leads us to, to do the things that would be pleasing to him. So it should be in a, 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 an obedience and a submission to his will. That's the type of fear that we should have. Uh, we should depend on his good favor. In verse 5, we see his response of fear and awe. It says, Woe is me, for I am undone, for I am lost, uh, and I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. This was Isaiah talking in chapter 6, verse 5. Um, Isaiah was saying, uh, man, fear and all, woe is me, for I am undone, I am lost. 
you know, the fear of God or the presence of God or the presence of his word uh, can, can bring us to the point that, that we, we realize that we are lost. We are in awe. Woe is me. Um, the New International Version renders the statement, Let all the people of the world revere him. The Lord is God. He's the God of all humankind, the all mankind. He's God of all the nations and all the people. There is no other God. In a world today, there's, there's many uses for casual terms to refer to God and who God is and what God is. Uh, some people call him their buddy or their grandfather or, or like I said earlier, the man upstairs. And, and that is not a reverential understanding of God. Um, our attitude to him should be marked by a reverence and an awe, a fear of him. And uh, that's why I think this message is so important today. We've come, become lackadaisical in how we worship. We Our prayers are just a blast uh, when we need something or when we think of something. But it should be a time of fellowship with the Lord, a time of reading his word, a time of studying his word, and a time of praying to him and letting him speak to us. Verse 9, um, it says this, it says, For he spake, and it was done, and he commanded, and it stood fast. He spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. However, how, how else should we become before him who spoke all this into existence? Who spoke it, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. How else we, should we reverence him? if not with awe and, and fear. For he spoke it in the, and, and it came into being. He commanded and it came into existence. Another tra a translation says, for he spoke it and it came to be. When he commanded it, it stood firm. What an awesome God we serve. And that's what these verses are talking about. How great our Lord is. How great he is. We're going to verse 10 through 15 there in Psalms 33. It says, The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught. He maketh the devices of people of none effect. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation of God. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. The Lord looketh from heaven, and he beholdeth all the sons of men. From the place of his habitation he looketh upon all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashioned their hearts alike, and he considereth all their works. The Lord bringeth the counsel of heathen to naught. He maketh the devices of the people of none effect. The Lord nullifies the, the purposes of countries and kings and leaders who try to deny his sovereignty. We see that in the Old Testament many times where a kingdom was wiped out or a king died because of uh, his, his failure to acknowledge God as, as the Lord and God as creator. The heathen here refers to the nations. It refers to the people, uh, those who did not acknowledge the Lord as their God. He said it bringeth those to naught. He made their ways, their devices, the things that they had uh, not to be effective. Um, he he hindered what they tried to do. He held back what they tried to do. He forbid what they tried to do. Their thoughts and plans and 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 purposes they had, he confused that and uh, he made those things fail. The nations, and this goes for us today as well, and, and the nations include individuals as well. But if we plan and we leave God out, then we can be sure that, this, it, that it will fail. Unless God is pleased with what we do, it will fail. If we go against him, if we try to, to say he is not God and he is not creator and we have a plan, it will fail. Our plans are made holy, are made effective because of him. He's the creator and the sustainer. Verse 11, it says, The counsel of the Lord standeth forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. Can you believe he, he stands forever? He has been forever. 
He was here before creation and he will be here after destruction. He will be forever. He, he's a God that will always exist. He's an infinite God. Um, the counsel of the Lord standeth forever. His design, his plan, his purpose for creation, all these things will stand forever and his people will stand forever. The heart, the thoughts of his heart are in all generations. Every generation has come, has acknowledged that there, there is a God. Not all people, but in every generation there have been people who uh, acknowledge that there is a God. The Bible has been around for all these years, and, and it stands as, as one of the, the most truthful books in, that's ever been written. And it, it is all truth. It is truth. Nothing can throw his plan off track. Nothing can thwart his plan. What he plan, what he wants to fulfill, he will fulfill. Uh, now, his purpose, his the way he fulfills it, the the what he wants to do may have to change because even as a loving God and a creator of us and sustainer of life, he has given us the right of choice. He's not going to force us to live the way that he would have us to live. He doesn't force us to do that. He gives us a choice. That's why we are have a choice. And that's why there is two destinations for eternity. For those who believe in Jesus Christ as their, their Savior. For those of us who make him Lord of our life. For those of us who repent and turn from our, the ways of the world. There is a place called heaven that's our place of eternity. And Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us. And he said, if I go to prepare a place for you, I will return again and receive you unto myself. This is what the, the choice that we make when we make a choice to follow Christ. If we make the choice not to follow him, if we turn against his word, if we go the way to the world, there's also a place of eternity. And that place is a place of Satan and his demons. It's made for them. It's a place of hell. It's a place of torment. It's a place of darkness. It's a place of separation from God. And that's not a place that we want to go. So we have, we have the choice. Uh, we, we, we have a choice to make. As people of faith, uh, we, we, we confirm that, that the eternal plan of God is still unfolding in our lives. And these things will be accomplished in his time. In Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3, it says, For the vision for an appointed time... For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it may tarry, wait for it, for it will surely come and it will not tarry. And even in the Old Testament, they realized that there would be a day of judgment and a day coming when the Lord would call his people home. And we go on to verse 12. It says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people who had chosen for his own inheritance. The people he's chosen for his own inheritance. Um, originally, this would have been talking about the Israelites. God had chosen them as his covenant people and he made his covenant with them in the Old Testament. But as long as they remained to, to, to true to God's purposes, they would receive his blessings. But by his divine authority, just as he selected Israel, um, now he has chosen us Today, he's chosen the, us under the new covenant that it's safe to say that he's speaking to us as Christians here as well. Christians are people who have placed their faith in God and in Christ and who follow him and have committed our life by, to them. It says, Behold, the Lord looketh from heaven, and he beholdeth all the sons of men. If you think God can't see you and God doesn't know uh, what you're thinking or doing, God does. He He's an all-knowing, all-seeing God. He sees all mankind. He observes everyone. He is well aware of what's going on, and and he knows each person's life. The Bible tells us he knows down to the number of hairs on our head. He knows everything about us. Um, in, in verse 14, it says, From the places of his habitation, he looketh upon all the inhabitants of the earth. He looketh upon them, all the inhabitants. He stares down at us. He gazes at us. He fixes a look upon us. He, he doesn't just glance, but he observes us. He watches us. He loves us, so he cares about us. 
And when you care about someone, if you're babysitting or you're watching someone, you, you watch them with care. It says he, he fashioned their hearts alike and he considered all their works. He fashioned their heart alike and he considered all their works. Um, it says here, like a potter at the wheel, he fashions and he motivates uh, humanity to act in a way that he would want them to act, to, to fulfill his sovereign will in our life. That's what he does. And it's, it is sovereignty. He's allowed us, as I said earlier, to have free will. And we can choose to serve him, or we can choose to sin. But the sin that we choose will not for it. It will not stop God's plan and his actions. God's purpose cannot be altered. The scope of God's reign is universal, and his power extends unto all the nations and to all people. In the second clause of this verse, the, the, sum, the psalmist defined the reasons for God's examination of our human hearts, the reason he looketh upon us, the reason he stares upon us. He said he discerns all our works. He looks at us and discerns. He knows why we do what we do. Sometimes we pretend and sometimes we can be good and sometimes we can look like Christians. But it's not what we do. It's not our not not our uh, our works. But it's it's what's in our heart. The works that we have are, are evidence of the saving faith that we have. So the New Testament is clear that works do not establish one's salvation. But it it is like uh, the the tree that the fruit that the tree beareth is is what we see. It, the tree is going to bear the fruit that's in the heart. And so we, it should be natural for us to, as Christians, to serve him. Our works should go to glorify him and not us and not us alone. Nothing escapes his attention. There are no secrets. He knows all of our plans. He knows all of our thoughts. When we acknowledge his power and, and reign in our lives, we will, we will be blessed as as uh, as we demonstrate uh, our faith through God in, in our works, and we'll demonstrate it through righteous living, so we'll come to know Him. And in closing, here on the last four verses, it says, "Behold, the eyes of the Lord is upon them that fear Him, and upon the hope in His mercy, to deliver their soul from death, and to keep them alive in our famine. Our soul waiteth for the Lord, and He is our help and our shield." For our heart shall rejoice in him, because we have trusted in his holy name. Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us as accordingly as we hope in thee. Behold, behold the eye of the Lord. It's a call to attention. He says, behold, listen to what I'm saying. The eye of the Lord is upon us. It's, 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 he's saying, carefully hear what I'm saying. Don't mistake what I'm saying. Listen, behold. The eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him and, and upon them that hope in his mercy. Them that fear him, them that stand in awe of him, them that are, are that wait with expectation of, of his coming. Um, he says that upon them is his fear and in them is the hope in his mercy. Mercy is one of the key uh, uh, elements of the nature of God. He is merciful. He's kind. He's loving. The Bible tells us that God is love. He's faithful. He's a steadfast love. It's a faithful love. It's an unfailing love. It speaks to the goodness of God when we talk about his mercy. It speaks to the goodness of his and his compassion and his favor. It's his covenant love to his people. He's promised us and he will keep his promise. But it's a reciprocating love on our part that we love him back. We should love him back. Verse 19, he says that he has this mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in a famine. He, he, he acts to deliver our souls from death. He acts to deliver us and keep us alive in times of hard times, in times of famine. He, he, it's a promise of provision. It's a promise of preservation uh, in, in the time of wait. So we can see that he is there for us to rescue us in times of danger um he's he's proclaimed the assurance of salvation and, the, and he's proclaimed the assurance of divine protection uh and he gives life and and he he protects us and he loves us he sustains life 
And the psalmist concludes here with his hymn of praise with a community of declaration and a commitment of prayer. He says in verse 20, Our soul waited for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Our help and our shield denotes he is the soul, our, our soul. Here the psalmist is speaking for the community as one faith and one body, which we are. It says, Our heart shall rejoice in him. That's the inner person, the will, the inside of us, the 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 our our the things that that are inside that drive us. Those things should be with a uh, just overflowing with joy and with love and emotion. Our heart shall rejoice in Him. Um, it's it's what it's, with all of ourselves we are to rejoice. With all of everything in us, we're to be glad. With everything that we have, a product of trusting in his holy name. It's a product of having comf confidence in his unwavering presence that he's always with us. And then in verse 21, it says, For our heart shall rejoice in him, because we have trusted in his holy name. Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us according to thy word, our hope in thee, in verse 22. Therefore, Lord, pour out on us your unchanging love, even as we wait with confident expectation, expectation for you to do what only you can do to enrich our lives. You see, everything that we have, everything that we will ever have, and everything that we'll ever be is because of him. Everything that we can hope for, everything that, that we live for should be for him. If you don't know the Lord as your Savior today, my prayer would be that you would Come to know him as Lord and Savior. You see, heaven is a free gift. Uh, the Bible tells us the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. It also it tells us it can't be earned. It's not deserved. There's nothing man can do to earn that gift. Man is a sinner. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Man cannot earn that. Man does not deserve that. There's no works. It says... For by grace are you saved through faith and not of works, lest any man should boast. It's a free gift of God. See, we have to accept it as that. We have to accept it as that. Without us knowing who God is and knowing who Christ is, then we, we can't have faith in him. I would, I would beg you to, to read the word. I beg you to call somebody to get with somebody if you are not a Christian. And, and get your faith solidified. Get your destination, your eternal destination, uh, solidified in Christ. And, and only Christ can do it. And, and he does it through his word and through the Holy Spirit in us. So my prayer for you, if you don't know Christ, is that you will come to know him before it's everlasting too late. I love each and every one of you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Let us live a life where we know that this God, this creator, this sustainer of life is within us and he gives us power to conquer everything and let us be all, uh, all in reverence of him. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, talk to you next week as we're getting closer to, to Christmas, the time where we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. I love you and I'll see you again next week. Thank you. I got love.